So this is session three, and we've got uh, two speakers with us. We've got Noah Carl here, who is a uh, still a postdoctoral researcher at Cambridge. Um, not, and not we quite. have, what's that? Not quite. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, or maybe not quite. Um, and we have um, Bruce Gilley from Portland State University. So Noah, uh, we're going to start with Noah's paper, The Lack of Viewpoint Diversity in British and American Universities. So take it away. Thank you. Yeah, so um, there's the title. Let's dive straight in. Um, right, so... Uh, uh, we'll do. Uh, what happened to me? Just a little bit of background first, because we were all asked to talk about our respective experiences. Uh, an open letter was signed against me, signed by 586 uh, academics, which wasn't very complimentary. <laughs> it, 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 it accused me of racist pseudoscience, uh, which is not a label I generally like to identify my work with. Um, there was some student protest against me in Cambridge, uh, and I was actually terminated following two uh, investigations, one into my own work and one into the uh, process by which I could have possibly been appointed. Um, so just a little quote from the open letter. Uh, we signatories call on St. Edmund's College, the University of Cambridge, and the Newton Trust to issue a public statement dissociating themselves from research that seeks to establish correlations between race, genes, intelligence, and criminality in order to explain one by the other. So I take this to be that you can't examine any of the pairwise combinations of variables there, which seems to me <coughs> totally absurd, even if you're opposed to the more controversial area of race differences and intelligence. But in any case, let's take a look at the uh, people who signed the petition, and in fact, the distribution of these people by subject, which I uh, painstakingly um, uh, garnered by doing searches online and uh, collaborating with a research assistant. And I'm sorry if the uh, labels are a bit small for you, but over here we've got sociology, yes. the, vast <laughs> <laughs> the vast majority of whom were qualitative sociologists, then English literature, obviously a lot of experts on uh, race and intelligence in that subject, <laughs> history, education, geography, anthropology, politics, uh, I can just use this, can't I? Uh, language, media studies, philosophy, uh, biomedical sciences, so a few, economics, creative arts, physical sciences, law, mathematics, engineering, and psychology. So you might, you might have expected psychologists would have the most to say about intelligence, but um, I'm collecting more data on the signatories, uh, hopefully for a forthcoming article, so stay tuned. Now to the presentation itself. What are these stylized facts concerning the phenomena of academics' political views? Well, I'd say they're the following. As we all know, left-wing and socially progressive views are overrepresented. Right-wing and uh, socially conservative views are underrepresented. Socially conservative views are particularly underrepresented. There's some relatively strong evidence in the, UK, uh, in the US and some somewhat more tentative evidence in the UK that the increase in the left liberal skew has increased since the 1990s. And finally, the overrepresentation is generally uh, believed to be greatest in the humanities and social sciences and somewhat smaller in the physical sciences and smallest of all in uh, subjects like engineering, <coughs> which I'm about to show you. So if we take American academics <coughs> by subject and consider data from voter registration databases uh, in 2017 that were compiled by uh, Mitchell Langbert in a recent paper, so if you take engineering, there's only 1.6 Democrats per Republican in that discipline, so a relatively small skew. Economics, which is known to be of somewhat more, uh, or somewhat less left skewed discipline, 5.5. Physics, 6.2. History, 17.4. Sociology, 43.8. <laughs> Anthropology, 133. <laughs> Communications is mathematically undefined, because... <laughs> He, they, the author was not able to identify any Republicans in his study. Now, he didn't survey the universe of academics, but that's still fairly uh, compelling evidence of a, of a skew, I would say. Here's some data that uh, a gentleman named Sam Abrahams uh, put together using the Higher Education Research Institute database, uh, in which respondents uh, in the academic sector were asked to identify as either moderate, liberal, far-left, conservative, or far-right. 
And as you can see, there's been a slight decline in the number of moderates and the number of far-right or conservative academics and a notable increase in this data set in the number of liberal or far-left academics uh, since the early 1990s. These are some data that I uh, analyzed uh, in, a, in a paper. Uh, basically, let me explain these two charts to you. They're both histograms, so they both show the distribution of views along a scale, in this case of economic leftism from uh, right wing to left wing, and in this case a sort of socially progressive value scale from um, conservative to more socially liberal or socially progressive. And grey is a general population and the black uh, is academics. And as you can see, the academic distribution has sort of shifted over to the more socially progressive and more left wing end of the respective scales. And as you can see, there's more overlap on the uh, economic dimension than there is on the social dimension. Uh, if I recall correctly, the, the distance in, in sort of standard units was about 80 or 85 percent of a standard deviation for the social scale and about 35 for the uh, economic scale. In the same study, I also find, found evidence that academics are more likely to read The Guardian than anyone else, uh, sorry, than members of the general population, which is another sort of interesting tidbit. Uh, here's some similar data from um, two different data sets that, again, I analyzed. And Understanding Society, a large British uh, household data set, and the British Election Study Panel, which is an internet sample, perhaps not quite as high quality. But what you, as you can see is, uh, depending on the exact specification, whether you weight or unweight the data, conservatives, are, people who identify with the Conservative Party and UKIP, which are the two sort of right-wing parties in Britain, are underrepresented here because if you go to the general population, these bars would be up to sort of there, and these bars would be down to sort of there, uh, indicating again a, a skew not only in the beliefs as measured on values, uh, as measured on attitude scales, but also in party support. Uh, this is a plot that I made which has to have the following caveat attached to it. Uh, the data for the first three uh, time periods were from one source and the data from the final time period is from a different source. Uh, this, this last source was a Times Higher Education poll, a self-selecting poll of academics uh, in which they were asked to declare their party support and this, these first three data points were from data collected by a sociologist at Oxford, I think unfortunately deceased A.H. Halsey. Um, but to the extent that these data can be meaningfully compared, they seem to show a relatively dramatic uh, increase in the proportion supporting the two most left-wing parties in the UK, it's the Labour and Greens versus the Conservatives. I didn't bother to include UKIP because UKIP didn't exist or at least wasn't prominent in the early, especially going back to the 1970s. Um, and of course, if, even if you change these two data points to the corresponding points that would be found from another data set, it wouldn't be dramatically different. The gap might be slightly narrower, but the point I think largely stands. And this is this slide, which should be appearing for you any second, uh, is from a recent paper by a, I believe he's a Dutch researcher who analyzed data from a European data set and discovered again when he plotted the mean political views, in this case on I think it's just sort of a left-right scale for <coughs> professors, that's academics, other professionals, and then CEO manager types, the academics are unsurprisingly a lot more left-wing than were members of the other professions. So that's data set from UK, US and Europe using several different metrics for quantifying political attitudes. Why might this skew be present? Why might it have come about? I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail about this. It is an interesting <coughs> social science question, but it's not the primary purpose of my talk. So I would simply leave you with the uh, hypothesis that there was an initial left-wing skew, perhaps that emerged in the early part of the 20th century when academic institutions assumed their current role and sort of became somewhat more, more meritocratic that was based on differences in personality and interest. We know from, from other studies that people with left-wing political views uh, often score higher on the dimension of personality openness to experience and such individuals uh, place less emphasis on family and less emphasis on income and uh, claim to place more emphasis on uh, intellectual pursuits. So I think there might have been an initial skew that doesn't require us to invoke any of these other four processes. But then over time, four other processes did come into play. The first of those, homophily, 
refers to just the tendency for people to associate with others who share their characteristics. Secondly, political typing is, a, is the view that certain professions can become sort of typed for individuals of particular characteristics, e.g. like being a builder might become typed for a you know, working class male and others, even if they felt they were qualified for that profession, wouldn't go into it due to, their, due to the disparity between their own characteristics and those of the putative type. Uh, discrimination obviously is a hypothesis that has to be considered perhaps and there indeed I'll present some evidence uh, that hiring committees are biased against people with certain political attitudes uh, and, and grant committees and that sort of thing and then finally there might have been a tendency for any people who entered the academy with views discordant with those of the majority to sort of reorient their views uh, to those of the majority so as to fit in better and, and not find themselves at the um, you know, receiving end of petitions or, or allegations of various sorts. What proximate effects could it be asserted that this skew of political opinion in the academy may have had? Well, I've, I've classified these into, into three broad categories. One is systematic biases in scholarship. Now, this primarily affects or is asserted to affect the social sciences and humanities. It's hard to think of lots of areas of the physical sciences where such biases could have crept in, but perhaps in certain areas of, um, I don't know, climatology, some people would assert there are biases. I'm, just not, I'm not qualified to comment on that. Um, but but uh, there's a couple of really good papers, including one by Jonathan Haidt and his co-authors, which go into this in a lot of detail, and they show how, how sort of uh, contested values have crept into theories and have been taken for granted as... as uh, widely accepted facts. For example, there was a paper that, they, that Jonathan Haidt and his colleagues cite which uh, sort of characterized people who placed a low emphasis on, on environmental activism as sort of denying environmental realities, which is not a totally unreasonable position, but it's a contested position rather than one that one should just take for granted. Then, of course, there's the denial and mischaracterization of research that is believed to threaten certain left-wing sacred values. I would argue I've been a victim of that myself. Many other people, not only in fields, controversial fields like IQ research, but also other fields um, that who, who, some of whose content appear to threaten left-wing values have as well. Then wish, witch hunts of the dissident scholars. We all, we all, many of us are familiar with those denouncements and petitions and protests. And then also politically biased hiring. Uh, caused by an atmosphere of groupthink where received wisdom goes unquestioned and sort of certain sacred values uh, are sort of are taken as sacrosanct. And what, so what sort of areas of research are the ones that appear to present the greatest threat to the left wing, sorry, the, the sacred values that prevail amongst those who hold the majority opinion? Well, I think it's generally areas where there is perceived to be a, a victim group of some sort and an oppressor group of some sort. <coughs> that would be sort of sex differences research, race differences research, colonial history, immigration and Islam, stereotype research, in research into transsexuality, and then research into the Israel-Palestine conflict. And which of those two perspectives proves more controversial seems to depend on the <coughs> department. Um, so now I just want to talk about a few interesting findings from the literature uh, that help us to understand how these skews within particular departments of particular field might have materially affected the disciplines. Uh, as I already suggested, I, I want to look at that question in more detail now. So here's a paper, just a quite simple paper by, I think it was uh, Buss and Von Hippel, 2017. They had a... Um, they surveyed their colleagues in the field of psychology and they asked them to rate themselves uh, from, lib from uh, liberal at this end to, I believe, conservative at that end. Uh, it may have been a multi-item uh, scale or it may have just been a single item scale, I can't remember. And then they asked them whether they agreed with certain canonical findings from evolutionary psychology. Partic I think they were pertaining to things like the roles of the sexes in evolution, which... Are which uh, I, ideas which are sometimes quite controversial. And here they found a positive correlation between the uh, self-professed ideology of the respondent and his or her willingness to accept those ca so-called canonical findings. That doesn't mean that the conservatives are right or that the liberals are right. It's just interesting that there was a sort of clear, albeit 
um, not imperfect relationship between ideology and willingness to accept certain putative scientific facts. This is a really fascinating study. I think it's unpublished as of yet by uh, Bo Weingard and his colleagues. <coughs> And what they did is they took a sample of, they weren't academics, I think they were just members of the general public obtained via Mechanical Turk or a platform like that. And they had three different uh, experiments. One concerning leadership, one concerning violence, and one concerning intelligence. And within each of these experiments they had three uh, groups of respondents. Conservatives again, moderates, and liberals. And within each of the experiments, they gave each of the groups um, vignettes to read concerning uh, a hypothetical person or something and his or her characteristics. And so in the, in the case of this first experiment, the hypothetical person was um, a, a potential leader, a prospective leader of some sort. And uh, the treatment was whether you got the passage saying that the person was uh, that the man was a better leader or whether you got a passage saying that the woman was a better leader. So it was designed to assess your sort of sensitivity to gender controversy. And what you can see is that among conservatives and moderates there wasn't much difference in the uh, propensity to censor this passage. So the scale is some measure of willingness to censor. But among liberals uh, they were much more willing to censor the passage when it was men who were described as better leaders than uh, when it was women who were described as better leaders. Moving on to the next treatment, it's the same setup, only here it, the two different um, treatments were Christianity being described as more violent versus Islam being described as more violent. And again, in the f among conservatives and moderates, there wasn't a, a great tendency, perhaps a slight tendency, to say that more to, to be more like to censor when Christianity was the religion um, being described as more violent, whereas among liberals there was a, a small tendency for them to say that, uh, to censor more when it, when it was Islam that was being described as more violent. Then finally we see the same thing concerning uh, intelligence when the treatment was that white people were described as more intelligent, liberals were much more likely to censor than when uh, it was a passage describing black people as more intelligent. And so you can imagine how this kind of tendency, if it occurred on a large scale or if it occurred at the level of reviewing papers or of assessing grant applications might lead to uh, systematic biases eventually. It's not to say that any of these particular claims are true or false, but just that there's a, a clear, uh, there seems to be an asymmetry in the, in the psychological responses to particular um, propositions. This is a very interesting study. It was conducted by uh, Horowitz and colleagues uh, just last year, I believe, in which they took a sample of American sociology professors, uh, I think quite a decent sample, if I remember correctly, using quite good uh, survey methods, and they asked them a whole bunch of different questions about their political attitudes. And here we have just a small selection of their results. And so over here we have, that's the percentage agreeing, that's the percentage disagreeing with various statements which were put to these respondents. And so the first one is, sociology should be both a scientific and a moral enterprise. 67% agreed with that. You may or may not agree yourself, but it's, I think, quite a stark result. This one, sociology should analyze and transcend oppression. Again, 60% agreed with that. Only 21% disagreed with it. The third one was, I support Marx's dictum to change the world. 62% agreed with that, and only 15% disagreed. <laughs> There, the results for these latter three were somewhat more encouraging for those of us concerned about free inquiry and free thought. Only 11% agreed that people who opposed gay marriage should not be sociologists. Um, when asked whether socio sociologists should try to foster community consensus, not a particularly controversial claim, 44% agreed. And then finally, when asked whether more political conservatives would benefit the discipline of sociology, uh, the respondents were apparently evenly split with 30%. Agreeing versus disagreeing. Yeah, I've not got that much left to do. So this is the final study I want to talk to you about. Uh, it was by, I believe, uh, Jamie Napier and her colleague. And again, it doesn't concern uh, academics. It's, I think, a sample of the general public. But what they did was just partition their sample into uh, people of different levels of education, from college graduate to those with less than a high school education, and then also by ideology. And the outcome measure that they reported was 
the extent to which people exhibited a pro-liberal prejudice as a, and negative values indicate a pro-conservative prejudice. And what they found, which is very interesting, is that the more educated the people were, the more polarised opinion was, i.e. the more people at the respective ends of the ideological distribution were to discriminate against their counterparts. So among people who were less in high school, there wasn't that much tendency to, for liberals to discriminate against conservatives and vice versa. But among those with a college degree, the a willingness to express prejudice was much greater, which I think, again, might have telling implications for behaviour of academics uh, in, their, in their work and in their administrative duties. Oh, sorry, one more. I was thinking about one more. I promise this is the last one, absolutely sure. Um, this was a study of, political, uh, of social psychologists, and they simply asked them in this study, how willing, you, willing would you be on a scale from one to seven to discriminate against conservatives? Because the vast majority of the sample were not conservatives, so it was a meaningful thing to ask. And this is the percentage of responses on that scale that were above four. And so 38% were willing to discriminate openly uh, in a hiring decision, 24% in a grant review, 19% on a paper review, and 14% on a symposium invitation. So pretty uh, interesting findings there. Um, before concluding, one final sort of empirical slide. The evidence I came across on academics and free speech paints a somewhat encouraging picture. The, only, the most recent survey I could find was again by Sam Abrahams, in which he asked respondents um, to choose between two statements. Do you prefer an open learning environment where students are exposed to all types of speech or a positive learning environment where that prohibits certain types of speech? And 70% of academics chose the first and 30% chose the, the, the second which suggests to me that there's a sort of 80-20 rule where there's a radical fringe of academics in concentrated in certain disciplines who are causing most of the problems. Some important contextual factors that have already been mentioned by other speakers are the consumerization, marketization of education, the growth of university administration, and also I think we have to consider the rising political polarization in society at large. Possible solutions that I've listed here on my, on my final slide are to encourage adversarial collaborations between scholars from different political backgrounds, to emphasize the incompatibility of the sacred value of truth and the sacred value of social justice, perhaps through the use of pre-commitment devices, like sort of statements on the website, uh, to form an academic NATO, that was Niall Ferguson's idea, and to create competitors such as online universities, I think that's Jordan Peterson's idea. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, the, this one, is just, this one is just worth reading out. So a, gen, a young man I found on Facebook who came to Oxford, he said, I came to Oxford to learn how to make policies to help poor kids stay healthy. My professor is trying to convince me there's no such thing as objective reality. I can't wait to tell the kids, turns out high blood pressure is a figment of our collective imagination. 